بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى اله وصحبه وسلم تسليما السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته الحمد لله I'm here again with another sacred text message Today it's going to be from Surah Al-Ma'arij. In that chapter, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, إِنَّ الْإِنسَانَ خُلِقَ هَلُوعًا إِذَا مَسُّهُ الشَّرُّ جَزُوعًا وَإِذَا مَسُّهُ الْخَيْرُ مَنُوعًا إِلَّا الْمُصَلِّينَ Verily or surely, the human being, and insan in Arabic is the word for a human being. In fact, there's a khilaf, a difference of opinion amongst the lexicographers. Most of them actually say that there is no feminine for this because it includes the male and the female. It probably is related to the word uns, which is intimacy, but it could also be from nesia. There's a difference of opinion again amongst scholars of the language. So the human being here, it really means the human being. Has there ever come a time upon the human being that he or she was not something remembered? So insan in the Arabic language also interestingly enough means the pupil of the eye because the human being was created for the vision of God. And so the actual what's known as bu'bu also in Arabic is insan. It's the pupil of the eye. And just an interesting side note about that, Ibn al-Jawzi who wrote a book, Tanwir al-Ghabash an Fadl al-Habash, removing the darkness on the virtues of the blacks actually mentions because at that time in his uh, country of Iraq uh, he saw that the black people were being denigrated so he wanted to write a book about the virtues of blacks and one of the things he said is that the most extraordinary part of the human being is the pupil of the eye because vision is the greatest of all blessings and God made it pitch black so he said that shows you the virtue of the color black So in this verse, Allah says that he created the insan, the human being, halu'ah. Halu'ah in Arabic is a very interesting word because it sounds hala'ah. It just sounds anxious just to say it like somebody hala'ah. So it means to be created in a state of angst, but also, interestingly enough, the Quran defines it in the next two verses. So in essence, in English, we would say, surely the human being was created halu' and then have a colon, and then that would follow. إِذَا مَسُّهُ الشَّرُّ جَزُوعًا When evil afflicts him, he panics, he's distraught, so he loses it. He loses his center, his equilibrium. وَإِذَا مَسُّهُ الْخَيْرُ مَنُوعًا And when good befalls him, he withholds, he becomes stingy, he becomes miserly. And so... In Arabic, hula is stinginess or miserliness, but hala is anxiety. So halu has both those meanings, and that's why the, what follows in the verse is an explanation of what halu is, that the human being is created in this state. In al-insan, verily. So this is a tawqid, or it's a strong statement. Illa al-musallin, and this is the mustathna in the Arabic language, except for those who pray. And musallin. Those are the people that are exempt from this state of hala. So when you look at the human being when we first come into the world, the very first thing that the human being does is it just starts to scream. A baby is completely anxious. And what settles the baby down is the halama. It is literally the halama in Arabic is the name for the breast, the nipple. And you give the child the halama and it becomes halim. It just calms down. And the word in Arabic for intellect, one of the words, there are many, the Arabs have many words for intellect. One of them is ahlam. So the intellect only functions when you're in a state of equilibrium. And so when you lose it, when you panic, you go into fight or flight or freeze. And so you lose it. So the people of prayer are people that don't panic. In other words, they're always reasonable. Their intellect is with them and they have aqal. And so, الَّذِينَ هُمْ عَلَىٰ صَلَاتِهِمْ دَائِمُونَ Those who are constant in their prayer. And it's very interesting, it says دَائِمُونَ Ibn Ajiba takes an ishara, or a type of esoteric interpretation here, is that this is the prayer of the heart. 
This is when a person is in constant prayer with God. But most of the Mufassirun say it means that they do the five prayers every day and they do them on time, fulfilling their obligations. And then, وَالَّذِينَ فِي أَمْوَارِهِمْ حَقٌ معلوم. Those who in their wealth is a حَق معلوم, a fixed and known right. So this is a right that the one asking and the one who's deprived has in your wealth, if you've been given wealth. So this is a very interesting aspect of a believer, is that those who are given wealth know that that wealth has a haq. It has a right that others are entitled to. But what's interesting about this, I mean, obviously at the face value of it, it's zakat. So it's the tax that we pay, the poor tax. It's not really a tax, but the tithing that we give, that God has demanded of us, we give for the poor people. That's 2.5% of your standing wealth if a lunar year passes over it. And also there's a whole set of uh, zakat obligations in harvest and also in livestock. But what's interesting about this is that there's also a haq in wealth that goes beyond zakat. A sadaqatu burhan. Charity is a proof of your faith. So to pay the zakat simply without having more than the zakat is something that really is dangerous for a person. Just like a person who, who never prays nafila, who only prays the fard. Because all of the shortcomings in, in the fard prayer on the day of judgment are going to be corrected by the nafila prayer. So whatever deficiencies you have in the fard, the nafila is going to help you with that. So this idea of haqqan ma'lum, you know, I've thought a lot about this. And one of the things that struck me most for years, I had been waiting for this book. It's called Siraj al Muridin. It's a book by the great Andrusian, sixth century scholar. He was the last student of Imam al Ghazali, and that's Qadi Abu Bakr ibn al Arabi, a brilliant man, just had an incredible intellect. He said at the age of 13, he'd completed the 13 books of Euclid and had made an astrolabe that he was able to determine where he was. So he was also a master of chess, even though he condemns chess. He actually writes about his experience showing an Egyptian aristocrat uh, certain moves that would improve his chess game. In any case, he was a polymath, knew many, many sciences, but is known in the Maliki Madhab for being one of our greatest fuqaha, and he was also a muhaddith. When he went to meet Imam al-Ghazali, he had just an incredible description of coming in. He said when he first laid eyes on Imam al-Ghazali, he said it was as if the sun had rose before him, that he had been in darkness all of his life up to that point. He actually writes this in his rahla. This was a time when Imam al-Ghazali was in Khalwa. He was in retreat. He wasn't really taking visitors and things. But anyway, one of the things that he says, and this really for me was a great relief, he talks about how there was a period of time there was famine and an epidemic, a waba. And during that time, a lot of people were suffering. And so in Siraj al-Muridin, he said he helped certain families. He could help two families and he used to give them loaves of bread every single day to help them during that time. But he had a dream and he mentions, he said, uh, I fell asleep one night and I saw as if I was sitting at a table and around me were all of my students and there was one of the men amongst my teachers he was a sheikh from my teachers who had had already passed away some time before that and we began to eat and we began then to talk to jadabna dhayl al-hadith fatafiqa ba'd al-talaba then one of the students said na'kuru wa nashba' wal muhtajin ala ma hum alayh here we are eating and satiating ourselves, and yet there are needy people everywhere. How could this be? So he's feeling guilty about sitting at a banquet when people, this is in a dream. He's seeing this in a dream. But he's feeling guilty about being in a banquet when people are out in this famine and in this epidemic. And so Ibn al Arabi said in the dream, I said out of some modesty given that my teacher was there but I knew that he would not give the, the right response to this question because he, he had surpassed his teachers and he said he would make a mistake because he didn't have the requisite knowledge to answer this question so here's what he said he said to the, the students 
نحن بأموالنا. It's not possible for us to give our wealth to all the people. We couldn't do it. Even if we gave all of our wealth, we would not be able to do that. ولا يلزمنا أن نكون على مثل حالهم. And also, it's not necessary that we are in their condition that they're in. This is the nature of the world, that there's times when people are in good times and difficult times. And then he says, this is what really struck me. But he said, but if each one of us could do what was possible to help one person. So if you took every wealthy person and he took it upon himself to help one or two people from the needy people, That would be enough to fulfill the obligation that they have. And then he said, and my proof, this is all in his dream. <laughs> These are the dreams of the awliya and the salihin. He said, my proof is that during the time of the Prophet, وسلم, during the time of the Prophet, the Sahaba, were, the companions of the Prophet, were in such difficulty that they were tying stones to their stomachs because of the hunger. In fact, Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas said that he spent 20 nights without food. And he said one night he was riding and his uh, animal, whatever it was, a donkey or a mule or a camel, crushed something and he said he ate it without even looking to see what it was. That's how hungry he was. And he said he was just fulfilling his necessities. So, that's how hungry he was. So then he said, at the time, the harvest of the Ansar was on their, their roofs. It was drying, the date harvest. And he said, and they, and they had meat in their homes. And some of the Muhajirin were like that also. But very few. And the Prophet this is what he, Qadi Abu Bakr said, the Prophet he did not take their money away from them. In other words, it's not like a socialist state where they take the money away and force you to give it to other people because there's no test. The test is whether you're going to fulfill your obligations or not. That's how Allah is testing you. He's testing the poor people with the wealthy people and the wealthy people with the poor people. Are they going to fulfill their obligations or not? If the state comes in and forces it upon you, then where's the test? There's no test. This is a very different understanding. And then he said, that the Prophet ﷺ was constantly telling the wealthy people, And then he was reminding constantly the poor person to be patient. And he would tell them what a greater place they had because of their patience in the afterlife for eternity. And this is something, again, in a materialistic world, people don't understand this. This is where they say, oh, this is just piety in the sky. You know, there's a old union song but that the communists said. It was a song that said, uh, you know, you'll eat by and by, you know, that pie in the sky. So they were making fun of the religious people telling people to be patient. We're actually believers. And the thing about the, the Prophet Sallallahu the Prophet Sallallahu went through the most difficult time They said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he would never go to bed without making sure that people were, were taken care of. And I actually did a, my own calculation, and I worked out that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam fed over 500,000 meals to the homeless people of, uh, of, um, of the Ahl Sufa. Because I worked out 70, there were on average 70, and I worked out the time that he was in Medina and, and feeding them every single day. He fed at least 500,000 meals to homeless people. And when he was asked, what is the best Islam? He said, An that you feed people. This is what the Muslims did. We should have food banks at this time. We should be helping people in their need. These are the things that Muslims do. And this is how also that people recognize by their fruits, ye shall know them. The Christians know that. And so when they see Muslims doing things like this, really helping people, and people, there's a lot of good people doing this, and I know that there's free clinics, there's other things, but these are the things that Muslims should be doing if they want to really help. And that's, that's what this verse is saying, that in their wealth they have haq ma'lum. So if you've been given the benefit of wealth, you should be helping people. We have a wonderful sister, Asma, 
in Baltimore, one of the most beleaguered cities in the United States of America. But we have this wonderful lady who has a shelter for people. She takes in all these battered women and people that have to, and she struggles. These are the people that we should be helping. These are the people that really need our help. Another person is Yusuf Wiley, who's down in Southern California, helping inmates who've been released, helping them transition. And he's somebody who has great experience in that. He himself went through immense tribulation. So there are lots of things that, that Muslims can do. That haq ma'noom that's in our wealth is very important. And we're going to be asked about it. And that's why, after that, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَالَّذِينَ يُصَدِّقُونَ بِيَوْمِ الدِّينَ See, it's immediately after that because the Prophet Sallallahu said اتَّقُوا النَّارُ وَلَوْ بِشَقِّ تَمْرَ Guard yourselves against the fire even with half a date. And once Aisha was sitting with one of her relatives and a, a beggar came by and she gave him half a grape. She, grapes were very precious but they came from Ta'if. She gave him half a grape. She had a few grapes. She gave him half a grape and the person that was sitting with her said does that benefit? And she said, how, how many atoms do you think are in that grape? <laughs> because on the Day of Judgment, you won't do an atom's weight of good except you'll see it. And so even half a date, just doing something. And so they believe in the Day of Judgment. Now this is really important because this is a hallmark of Muslims. They believe in the Day of Judgment. And Qadi Abu Bakr, going back to him, he has a chapter on Yom al-Hisab, the day of reckoning. The muhasib is like the accountant. Every business has an accountant. And that accountant, hopefully, is making sure that your, your income is greater than your outcome. And so the day of judgment is the day when we have the tabulation of our life on earth. And everything will be recorded. It's all being recorded. And so we come on that day and that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says they believe in the last day. And then it says, That they have fear of their Lord's punishment. So even though they're believers, they don't feel secure. Like Abu Bakr Siddiq anhu said that if I had one foot in paradise and one foot out of paradise, I still would not feel secure until I was firmly in paradise. And so this is something that the believers... Uh, have that they, they actually have a sense of the, the momentousness, the awe of that day. And there's a hadith from Abu Huraira where the Prophet ﷺ said that on that day Allah will meet his servant. فيقول, hey, fool, hey, so and so, Alam ukrimka, wa 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 Didn't I honor you? Didn't I give you a position? Didn't I leave you to enjoy life? فَيَقُولُ بَلَى Indeed you did. فَيَقُولُ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala أَفَظَنَنْتَ أَنَّكَ مُلَاقِيَ Did you think you were going to meet me? قَالَ فَيَقُولُ لَا No. فَيَقُولُ فَإِنِّي أَنْسَاكَ كَمَا نَسِيتَنِ Today I forget you just as you had forgotten me. Right? كَذَلِكَ أَتَتْكَ آيَاتُ فَنَسِيتَهَا فَالْيَوْمْ تُنْسَى the, the Quran reminds us that the, the verses come to them and they forgot them. So on that day, they're forgotten. This is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says to him. And then the second he says, Ey fool, alam ukrimka, alam usawidka, wa uzawidka. Didn't I honor you? Didn't I give you a position? Didn't I give you a spouse? Wa usakhir lak al khayla wal ibl. Didn't I give you wealth, camels and horses? Wa adharka tar'asa wa tarta'a. And I gave you this position and, and let you enjoy your life. Indeed, didn't you think you were going to meet me? I forget you just as you've forgotten me. And then the next one comes and the next one. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He says, Iqra kitabaka kafabi nafsika liyoma alayka hasiba. Read your book, the book of your deeds, and suffice your own soul as your reckoner. Because the human being knows. Human beings know what they've done. Even if he gives all of his excuses. So then for the believer, right, he gets the hisab. 
And then when he sees his situation, he thinks, I'm going to perish unless I get the sabiqa of the husna from Allah, the grace from God. And then, وُضِعَتْ لَهُ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ فِي كِفَّةِ الْمِيزَانِ And then his word, لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ is put in the other scale. So his deeds are in the scale. And then it puts لَا إِلَهَ and it outweighs everything. فَرَجَحَتْ لَهُ السَّمَوَاتُ وَالْأَرْضِ is more weightier than heavens and the earth. And so this is a great gift to the believers. But this is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says about that day that they believe in the last day. They believe in the Yom al-Hisab. And they're preparing for it. The Prophet ﷺ used to do death remembrance every day. And he said, أَكْثِرُ مِنْ ذِكْرِ هَذَا مَنْ Do much remembrance of the destroyer of pleasure. Because much of life is mata. It's in, I mean, we have our tribulations, but we also have a great deal of enjoyment and food and companionship and wealth and security and homes and all these things that Allah has given us. These are great blessings. But there is a reckoning. There is a hisab. And this, so this is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says. And then he reminds us, Inna adhaba rabbihim mamun. They're not secure from that punishment. Nobody should feel secure. I always marvel at certain religions who believe they're saved. They just say we're saved. Because first of all, they don't know if they're going to lose their faith. There's people that lose their faith, even in those religions. There's people that were believers, and then they come out with a book, Why I Don't Believe in in God Anymore. There's even preachers that come out as atheists or come out of their closet or whatever they were doing, and they, they say this. I was once on an airplane with my friend and brother, and we sat next to a man who'd been a Christian, and then he said that he realized that his own sexual appetites weren't consonant with his Christianity. So he gave up his Christianity. That's what he told us. He gave up his Christianity. And I just, I looked down, I said, I'm really sorry for you, you know, that you would give up the eternal for the temporal. So that's one of the tragedies of life on earth is that people do lose their faith. And that's why that human beings panic when trials come to them. They pan- They lose it. There's people that lose their faith. But then you have to question, did they have faith in the first place? Because the whole purpose of faith is to get you through all those difficulties. I mean, the word in Arabic for, for believer is mu'min, billah, the one who secures himself with God. I mean, if you took it literally, aman abi is to secure, to give yourself aman with God. الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَلَمْ يَلْبِسُوا إِمَانُهُمْ بِظُلْمٍ أُولَٰئِكَ لَهُمُ الْأَمَنِ they are secure. Those people are in a state of security who believe and don't commit shirk. They're in a state of security. And so then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Those who protect their private parts. And that means that they, they protect their private parts except in the confines of marriage, in lawful sexual relations. Because sexual relations outside of what God has permitted it leads to la taqarbuzina inhu kana fahisha wa sa'a sabila do not go near adultery or fornication the arabs have one word for it zina because it's an obscenity it's foul it's a fahisha wa sa'a sabila and it takes you down a terrible way and all you have to do is google the statistics on stds and on all the things that happen to people who transgress these hudud. Tilka hududullah fala ta'taduha. These are the hudud of God. So don't go beyond them because the hudud are there to protect us. This is God's mercy towards us. It's not anything else. It's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's His mercy towards us. And so this is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that they guard their private parts. That, that's not blameworthy if it's rightful and lawful. And those who go beyond that, they are the transgressors. They go, Adun, they have transgressed the limits. And those limits are not just moral limits, they're biological limits, and they will have repercussions. And one of the tragedies in American society, and I apologize for people that, because I know we've had people from all over. Uh, listening to this, but in the American context, uh, but this applies everywhere. One of the tragedies is this loss of a sense of chastity and the importance of a female guarding the virtue of chastity because the great virtue of a woman is chastity. This is not sexist. It's not 
uh, to say this. There's nothing wrong with saying this because a woman is far more susceptible to venereal diseases than a man is just because of the nature of the epithelial lining. And this is why the STDs amongst women are much higher. They don't tell them that. And it's a crime to these poor girls that think that they can be promiscuous and go about and do these things like some men do and not suffer the same consequences. No, it's much worse. It's worse for them. And it's bad for men. And chastity is a virtue for men as well as women. But women traditionally guarded that. The women of the Arabian Peninsula, sometimes when they were taken from tribes would come, they would raid other tribes and defeat them and take the women as captives. The women would throw themselves off and break their necks because they did not want a man to take them. And this happens in their cultures where women do this. I mean, it's it's a tragedy. I mean, the rape of the Sabines is one of the great masterpieces of Western uh, art. It's horrible. When things break down, it's the women who suffer. And that's why if you have a society where you, you say masculinity is toxic, where you take away men's chivalry and the idea that they're there to defend women and children, when you remove that concept from them, that will work temporarily in a culture that has still a civil society. But when things break down, look what happens. Who suffers? Who suffer? Everybody suffers, but the ones that suffer the most are the women and children. If you don't believe me, just ask the poor Yazidi girls about what happened to them. Where were the chivalrous men then? Where were the men that should have come and rescued those poor women from the horrors of war and the, the pillaging and horrible bestial ravaging of men that should not even be entitled to the name man? And even to call them a beast would be unfair. Demons are the only word that is appropriate for people like that. Demons. Because even animals don't do these things. Animals take what they need and they leave the rest. Have you ever watched those animal channels? Like they'll show like the lion and then all the zebras will run. But then they catch one zebra and then they all go back to eating. Because they know the lion's not, it's not like a man who comes in there and just kills everybody. The lion just takes what it needs. They say, oh, you know, poor Herbert, he's lunch today for the lion, but we're all okay. And that's what happens in in the animal kingdom. But humans know they gloat in the ability to inflict cruelty on others. These are the horrors. So this is what Allah is telling us, that these are transgressions. Those who shepherd well, who watch and guard their sacred trusts and their covenants, This is a hallmark of believers. The Prophet used to say many, many times, three times. And he said this many times. The Sahaba said that he said this constantly, that whoever is not trustworthy, he has no faith. And this is something also, it's important to remember that you know, what's up with you? How are you judging? Do you make Muslims like criminals? But you should also not make criminals like Muslims. Because there's a big difference between the righteous and those who lack righteousness. One of the most fascinating verses in the New Testament is from Peter. who Actually, he says that he realized that whoever feared God and did right in whatever land he was from would be pleasing to the Lord. That's an indication about a truth that many Christians, I don't think, have reflected on that verse. But that's, we see that, that people that are believe in God and are righteous, those are the people that God loves. One of the uh, heretics once said that uh, about the dia, the blood money for a hand, he said, uh, What's up with a hand that is worth 500 dinars as a dia. Like if you cause somebody to lose their hand, you have to pay them 500 gold coins. Yet it gets cut off in just a quarter of a dinar. So he's like, that doesn't make sense to me. So Qadi Abdul Wahab, the great Maliki scholar, he said, That the the dignity of its trustworthiness made it of great value, but its treachery made it worthless. 
And another said, لَمَّا كَانَتْ أَمِينَ كَانَتْ ثَمِينَ فَلَمَّا خَانَتْ هَانَتْ When it was trustworthy, it was precious. But when it became treacherous, it lost its value. And so it's very important to recognize that, that there's a big difference between the righteous and between others. It's also very dangerous to think of yourself as righteous. We ask Allah to make us amongst those who are righteous because we don't know if in God's eyes we're criminals. May Allah forgive us. But that's important to remember that those people that are out stealing and doing horrible things, I mean, that doesn't matter. Two wrongs don't make a right. You can't say, oh, because some people steal, you know, I can steal. No. We're people of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, inshallah. We're the people that stay within the hudud. And so that's one of the hudud, is that we don't do that. And that's why there's going to be oppression in this world. And the oppression won't end until the world ends. It's the nature of the abode. And if you haven't worked that out yet, just give it some time. You'll get there eventually. If you have enough life on earth, you'll realize. Anybody who knows history, and that's part of the problem with modern people, is they don't study history. They don't read. They don't study. They don't think about things. And I heard somebody interviewed recently who, he's a very famous poet, but he's old now. He said, you know, I'm getting very interested in history. And the person asked him why. He said, because I realize I'm about to become history. People don't think about that, that we are going to leave the world. But history is important. And that's why one-third of the Qur'an is sacred history. One-third of the Qur'an is sacred history. And the Qur'an tells the same stories over and over again in different ways with nuances, but they're essentially the same stories of people being oppressed. That if you believe in God, you're going to be oppressed. You're going to have difficulties. This is just dunya. It is dunya. And that story is repeated over and over again to let you know that on the Day of Judgment, Believe it or not, on the Day of Judgment, and we're people that believe on the day. That on that day when they are all manifest before God, nothing is hidden from God from them. And God says, who has the dominion now? All the tyrants, all the oppressors, all the dominions that they held, they're all gone. On that day, every soul will be recompensed for what it earned. There's no oppression today. That's what Allah says. That's the only day where there won't be oppression. So if you don't have patience to wait, if you think you can get justice now, you will never get justice in the dunya. If somebody wrongfully kills somebody, you know what justice is in our religion? $150,000 approximately. That's what you get. $150,000. That's redressing the wrong according to Sharia. They pay the dia. If it's a private crime, the family can forgive. If it's a public crime, then the family doesn't have the right to forgive. But if it's a wrongful death and it wasn't intentional, then it's a dia. That's what's paid. $150,000. That's dunya justice. How do you replace a life? $150,000. That's sharia. Right? A thousand gold dinars. That's sharia. It might be a little higher now because gold's higher. But the point is, is that that's worldly justice. The real justice is on the day of judgment. But the truth is, if you're wise, and I'll end here. It's been a long podcast. <laughs> if you're wise, you won't want justice. You want mercy. Because the Prophet ﷺ said, Man la yarham, la yurham. Those who don't show mercy, mercy will not be shown. If you want justice, that's fine. You can have justice. But just know, by the standard that you judge, so shall ye be judged. That's it. So, God's al adl, but he's also, he doesn't begin his book in the name of God, the just, the revenger of wrongs. That's not how he doesn't begin it. Bismillah al Adal and Muntaqim. He begins it. Bismillah Rahman Rahim. In the name of Allah, the merciful, the compassionate. Big difference. Thank God. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Walladinuhum bi shahadatihim qa imun. Those who are resolute and firm in their testimonies. So they're they're upright in their testimonies. They don't lie, they don't make false accusations. This is really important. But also, I mean, we could look at it in an ishara sense. There are also people that establish their shahada with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then finally, ala salatim So it begins with illa al-musallin. And then it, the very first 
quality is that they're constant in their prayers and it ends those who muhafaza is like to guard your prayer yuhafidu alayh that they make sure that their prayer is done on time with the requisite conditions fulfilling the faraid the sunan and hopefully the mandubat the obligations the uh, practices of the prophet that were consistent and also all of the recommended things and then allah says ulaika fi jannatin mukramun they are in paradises honored that's the ikram of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alhamdulillahi rabbil alamin